scourge facing America from within. The president takes the opioid crisis very seriously. The kid got snagged at the border. The courier? Took a year of undercover work to get this far. Maybe it's dangerous to press a big sale now. Yeah, but what choice do we have? Our product will be the first truly non-addictive painkiller. What the hell is going on? All the addiction centers are lighting up. And then by day 10, they're dead. I'm looking for my son. Were you aware of any issues with your son? Like what? Based on your results, you want Northlight to pull their billion dollar drug. It can cost you a hell of a lot more than your teaching job. You've got to have a plan. A plan for telling the truth. Careful. Should this kid get an itch to name names, it would be unpleasant for everyone. They're gonna come after you. But what you're doing now may be the most important thing you ever do. You had my son run drugs for you. This is the biggest public health crisis since tobacco! It's not our responsibility. Then whose is it? You cannot walk into that by alone. We can't quit. We can't stop. What do you think we're here to do? To make a difference? We can touch you anywhere in the world. We're running out of time. Last chance. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm here today with Nicholas Dorecki, um, the director, actor, and writer of the film Crisis that's out today in Canada and has been out in theaters um, for a little while already. Pleasure to be here, Katrina. Thanks so much for, for coming. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about Crisis and how you started developing this film? Absolutely. Um... So uh, this film really started, this started a long time ago with a personal uh, connection. I had a friend who got involved with opioids um, about 15 years ago when so little was known and, uh, and he's not with us anymore. Nice. And, and so it started with pain pills and then it became heroin. And, and, and you know, we didn't understand it at all because this was a, a bright guy who was from a good family and made no sense to us. But, you know, we closed the chapter on that. Um, now, then about maybe five, six years ago in the US, um, a lot of information started to come out about what was the role of the opioid manufacturers in what became an escalating epidemic. Um, and so I started to read about it like everybody else. And I thought, boy, this looks weird. Um, there's, there's, you know, a lot of people making a lot of money and there's a lot of people getting sick or dying. Um, what's going on? So I hooked up with some reporters at the Los Angeles Times, and they had done a lot of investigation into these pharmaceutical companies and, you know, whether or not the companies knew that the product was more dangerous or more addictive than had been advertised was a, a question of their study. Mm -hmm. And so I started to, to read a lot about this, and then I hooked up with this undercover detective who had uh, busted a lot of the cartels that this film is modeled on. This film is really inspired by true events, but based heavily on real stuff. So... Um, I did all this research and I found, you know, it was a crazy situation. The, a product was being made in a lab that had all these wonderful life healing properties. But, um, you know, some of the people that took it really got very deep into it and, and safeguards, I think, weren't there to protect them. And a lot of money went into marketing and promoting something very dangerous for people perhaps that didn't need it or shouldn't be involved with it. So, um, so that inspired me. And then I started just kind of thinking, writing, dreaming. I love thrillers. Mm -hmm. um, I had loved, uh, you know, 21 Grams. I like those, those yeah. movies where they look at things from different viewpoints, you know, and, and tell multiple stories. And I thought this was a great topic to do that. So when you said cartel, um, because I know that the, um, in crisis, they have the, 
the drugs were moving from Canada to the US via Montreal. Um, so when you say cartel, is that like the Mexican cartel? Because that's what I think of when I hear cartel. Um, or how is well, this I think, organized? Well, I think that's, uh, that's what everyone thinks of. You know, there's all this focus in, you know, Sicario, or is Mexico, right. the border, cocaine. Um, but what, you know, there, there's another border, right? Which is for us, the Northern border. Right. Um, and it's 2000 miles is totally unpatrolled. So this movie starts out with a boy crossing the border with a sled. That was totally a true story. Um, I just took that out of the paper. Uh, this kid was caught with half a million dollars worth of pills crossing the border. And, um, you know, there's no uh, there's no enforcement there. So you can kind of do whatever you want. And then I started to research Montreal. And, you know, it's such a beautiful city. It's this incredible, you know, cultural apex and uh, but it's also a port city, right? And there's, mm -hmm. you know, smuggling and trafficking. And uh, so so I thought that would be fun to explore. And, and we'd never really seen a, a French Canadian crime syndicate. Um, I just thought that would be a lot of fun in a movie. Um, and indeed, we have this wonderful actor, Guy Nadon, who plays Mother. Um, yeah, you know, it's kind of really a great. national treasure there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, he's, he's, he's warm and, 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 and fatherly, but he's also menacing and ice cold. Uh, so, you know, I thought, I just thought it would be a lot of fun to explore that. And it, it was all very real. Um, so right. it, it fit nicely. Right. Yeah. I think um, from everything I've been reading too, and I've heard firsthand from friends about the opioid crisis is that it is affecting a lot of middle-class people in Canada and the U.S., who maybe had an injury at work or an injury working out, and then they take painkillers and get addicted very quickly. So it's it's nice to see a film that's addressing this. Yeah, I mean it's 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 terrible, really, because I think it used to be, you know, oh, addiction that 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 that's something for the disenfranchised, you know, the people on the fringes of society. But really, this whole thing hit like a Category Five hurricane, mm -hmm. and and we saw, you know, that addiction really doesn't discriminate. No. Here you have a product that's made in the lab um, and, you know, for, for a certain number of people who take it for a back injury or whatever, they're fine. But, you know, there could be as much as 20 to 50 percent of people who take it. And because of the way it works in their body, mm -hmm. they very quickly become dependent on it. And, right. and so then all of a sudden the doctor doesn't want to give it to them anymore. And they go, all right, give me a little. OK, the doctor will play along. After a while, the doctor will say no more. Mm -hmm. Then what do they do? They got to go to the street to get right. it. And then it's very expensive. So they'll burn through their 401k, their savings in this country, you know, and then ultimately they often will switch to heroin because it's so much cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, and this is this is a terrible cycle, you know, that comes really through people with uh, no fault of their own. And, and that's something we wanted to highlight, uh, kind of show how it got out of control. Right. Um, another um, part that I want to talk about of the film is that... Uh, we have the lead character played by Army Hammer for the police, yep. undercover, playing that he is um, involved in this drug trade, but as well, he is um, dealing with it firsthand with his sister as an addict. Um, when you developed all of these characters, why did you choose to have that firsthand connection for him with um, uh, his sister played by Lily Rose Depp? Well, again, that, that comes really out of research um, and you know, you could almost say, oh, is it a cliche or is it trite, you know, that a law enforcement uh, person in the drug trade would have a family member who has a problem with drugs. Mm -hmm. um, but what I found in the research is um, they all do. I mean, <laughs> first of all, addiction touches everybody. You know, as you mm -hmm. and I sit here and speak, I guarantee we both know someone who has right. a problem with addiction, right? But a lot of the DEA agents, um, they're compelled to go into the business uh, because they have personal experience with addiction. Um, and I had, you know, based this a bit on a couple different law enforcement officers I knew, both of whom uh, had close family members who were struggling uh, with the serious, uh, serious issue. Um, so it's really more common than you would think. And, mm -hmm. and what I like about it is I think, you know, the American drug war really has not been a great success. No. Um, and, but, but, but you think, well, why, you know, is it, is it the cops with people involved? But as I talk to drug cops and I talk to people in enforcement, you know, some of these people are rather sophisticated. Mm -hmm. Um, and especially if they have a family member who's involved with drugs and, and, and struggling with addiction, um, you know, they can often have personally a more nuanced view than the just get tough on crime. 
Um, but really it's about, you know, I think for them, it's about trying to disrupt the systems that, that make this stuff possible. That's something we explore a lot in the film, which is, you know, Michelle yeah. Rodriguez, who plays the DEA supervisor, ultimately mm -hmm. says to, to, to Jake, to the cops, you know, what do you think we're here to do? Make a difference? You know, mm -hmm. if, if the people wanted a difference, they'd do something about it. So I think it is, uh, it is, it, it, it does get personal um, for, for these characters in the film and for the people working on the front lines in real life. The yeah. question is, how do we, how do we do something about it? You know, do we do it by, by busting willy nilly, uh, you know, little, little dealers or cartels, um, right. you know, or do we address it at the top, which is where are these drugs coming from? And if they're coming out of a lab, are there, are there safeguards in place to protect the public? Right. Um, getting back to Michelle Rodriguez, I thought she was a really strong character in the film. Um, why did you choose to write as the protagonist of this film of a cop to be a white male rather than, let's say, a woman like Michelle Rodriguez? Um, that's really just my cis bias at work. No. Um, <laughs> I, um, well, why was it, uh, you know, interesting. So Mich Michelle's an old friend. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd asked her to be in the film. You know, that's the role she wanted to play. Okay. Um, I think we had explored at one point, maybe, you know, what if she was the cop or, you know, but I think she liked the supervisory position of power. Mm -hmm. um, also, man, it was so cold where we were shooting. I don't know <laughs> if I could have got her to stay there uh, to do all of uh, all of the army scenes. Um, but, you know, I think it, 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 it's always a question of, you know, when you're casting, do you, um, you know, who's right for the role? you know, what's the right circumstance. That was just sort of how the character had occurred to me. Um, you know, and I had played, I had played with different configurations. I knew I needed, you know, if we had three characters. We definitely wanted one character to be a woman, uh, you know, because uh, three guys, that would just be too boring a movie. Uh, yeah. But, um, uh, you know, but, but, but what was the right balance for that? I mean, sometimes it's just sort of how it comes in the mind, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then I guess there's believability questions to some extent, you know, would the drug syndicate be comfortable selling drugs to a woman or would they worry if she's undercover guy? Is it realistic mm -hmm. that, you know, so I don't know, these are just all the kind of impulses that balance in, but certainly I could see another film, maybe Crisis 2, uh, depending on how it does out there, um, where we follow Michelle around. But I, I paid her so little that I don't know how excited <laughs> she's going to be to come back. Um, she really did this as a as a friend um, to support the topic because she also had people from her uh, her life who you know she lost opioids. She's been mm -hmm. very vocal about that. Yeah, um, I'm sure. I'm sure at this stage, all of us have. It's it's so prevalent. Um, I know, like bringing that up though, I just am interested always, especially in writers and directors these days of you know, making space for more female actors in leading roles. So that's why I wanted to ask you about that. Um, the, that, leads, that leads to the Vanity Fair article that just came out about Army Hammer. Um, and there was a quote in there by Luca Guadagnino, who's one of my favorite directors. And he said that the reason why he cast um, Army in Call Me By Your Name was because he brought a lot of personal turmoil and grit to the character. So I just wanted to ask you about your experience of having him as the protagonist in this film and in light of everything that's gone on with him recently, um, how you think that he brought that to this role in Crisis? Well, I think, you know, every actor, you know, and I, I do think Army's a very good actor. Mm -hmm. uh, no doubt. You know, I think that they, uh, that they use things from their life, you know, into creating a character. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, the, my relationship with Army was professional, right? We, mm -hmm. we, we weren't, uh, I don't know, I know him only in the context of making the film. Right. Uh, so, so I don't, I don't really have too much personal insight. I don't, you know, somebody once, one of my teachers once said to me, the director's job is not to be a psychologist. No, no. The director no. is there to get a performance. No, exactly. Uh, and so, and so I'm just wondering what he brought to the performance that you think was very valuable in this role for Crisis. Yeah, I mean, well, I think he brought, I mean, first of all, he was extremely thorough in his research, you know, and he and I went around with the undercover detective and went mm -hmm. to all the real places. And I did this, you know, I did this both with Gary and Evangeline mm -hmm. of really, uh, you know, and even Veronica Ferris, who plays the CEO of the pharmaceutical company of mm -hmm. going to the real places, sitting there with the real people. Um, so, you know, very diligent in terms of the research and dedication to understanding the real people. Um, 
you know, and then I think he brings, as do all of these actors, I, mm -hmm. I think I tend to choose, you know, actors who bring an intensity, um, who bring a kind of, you know, madness. Yeah. Uh, now, in the case of Army, you know, who knows, I, I, who knows where that's coming from? Maybe yeah. it's coming from true madness or not. Uh, you know, I, it's, I guess we'll, we'll see. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but I think, you know, um, these great actors, uh, you know, they really can go to some dark places in the mind. And I think you see that with Evangeline's character in the film. Mm -hmm. Definitely. You know, she was really, and I think her performance is superb, right? She plays a woman who's, uh, you know, searching for her son, who's, uh, tragedy befalls her and she becomes almost, you know, like, a, I don't want to say Dirty Harry, but there's mm -hmm. a, a certain mission of vengeance there. And, and yet, even in these kind of high octane situation, she's so convincing and yeah. she has this depth of feeling in the role. And that was not easy for her to do. You know, and she went to these really dark places and, and would kind of isolate from the crew and, mm -hmm. you know, because she's a lovely person, right? But she, in order to inhabit that character, that was the process that she needed to go through. And I think um, there are, in, re in reality, there are a lot of characters like her who are dealing with the opioid crisis, right? Who are moms who are trying to live a normal life and maybe people don't even know they're suffering with this addiction. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 again, that I know from personal experience, you know, mm -hmm. people that are high functioning, but they've got, for whatever reason, however they came to it, they've got this monkey on their back. Mm -hmm. And it's so difficult to beat this stuff. Right. You know, the, the lifetime recovery rates, like one in 10, two in 10. I do think it's getting better as we, we get more knowledge about the treatment, uh, you know, of, of how to help people who unfortunately get involved with opioids. Mm -hmm. um, but I, 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 I think, um, you know, it, it really does affect so many um, more than you know more than I think we know or want to admit and but I think we're coming to admit that and then saying okay we got to take a look at this I mean just today it was announced in the news that you know Purdue Pharmaceutical one of the major opioid manufacturers the owners of that company are now stepping down and uh, divesting and there's going to be big settlements paid mm -hmm. and we had uh, McKinsey which is a big consulting firm here that had played a role in marketing they just paid a 600 million dollar uh, 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 dis disbursement to uh, ad admit their role in the crisis. Right. Um, so, and yet, you know, how much has changed? You know, it's off the front page because COVID has consumed so much of our attention. But um, right, and I read we, we just did a like that there was more deaths from opioid um, overdoses in North America than there has been from the pandemic in this past year. It's really very sad. I mean, you must have done real research to see that because it's not what it was where it was on the front page every day, New York Times, you know, right. the Globe and Mail, whatever. Now it's all, you gotta go check the stat and, and the problem's raging. It's a yeah. raging problem, um, yeah. but it's just not so visible. No. Uh, you know, so that's hopefully what this film does is, uh, you know, apart from just being fun to watch and, you know, totally. if you like thrillers, uh, you know, hopefully it increases some discussion of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for speaking with me today. Um, and for everybody who wants to watch the film, it's called Crisis. It's on iTunes. Um, you can stream Number it one on iTunes in America for the last two weeks. Amazing. Uh, so hopefully now that'll be the case in Canada. Yeah. Check it out on iTunes in Canada. And it is in theaters in the U.S.? Yes, it is. We, we, we were the number one independent film in the movie theaters the number one film in limited release. Um, it's really, audiences are connecting with it everywhere. Um, and, and I think it's affecting people. Yeah. We see that and we hear from people and we love to hear from people. So check us out um, you know, on Instagram at Crisis Movie or on Twitter. Excellent. And uh, we'd love to hear what you think of the film. All right, well, thank you so much, Nicholas. I really appreciate you speaking with me today. It's a pleasure. Katrina, thank you. Okay, thanks.